Uh, thanks, Lucy. Can I just check that um, I've got the right um, view up yes, on you the do. slide? Yeah, you yeah. Do. yeah. Thank you. I've also got some rather annoying subtitles, um, which um, is going to irritate all the participants. Um, we were trying to turn them off earlier, but um, they are a legacy from a year of um, teaching uh, attempted online, uh, where students have been frustrated with <laughs> my inability, apparently, to speak loudly and clearly enough. Um, but anyway, here we are. We're stuck with these subtitles, and they probably won't pronounce or spell everything as, as it should be. Um, so just ignore. PowerPoint has a mind of its own. Thank you very much to Sustainable Places for inviting me to speak um, today. And um, I'm going to talk, as TC suggested there, about some, some new research. Um, hopefully, there'll be plenty of time at the end for, for questions. Um, I don't intend to use up all the time. But um, just in case I get carried away, I'm sure TC will give me a, a warning if I need to start wrapping up. That'd be really helpful. Okay, so I'm going to um, start by just talking uh, a little bit about the overview of the talk. Um, so we're just going to be focusing on um, experiences of Italian migration and diaspora. And we're going to be focusing on this sort of theme of those who leave or who left Italy and those who stay or stayed in Italy during the years of mass emigration. And then we're going to be homing in on this area in the south of Italy called Calabria, which some of you will know, thinking about um, how that was a place that, that lost large numbers of its population to emigration and how that's resulted in, in, in a felt loss of place um, and how the remaining sense of place is bound up with experiences and um, representations of stigma. Then I'm going to home in even further uh, on a particular little village, uh, one of the um, iconic um, semi-abandoned villages of Calabria nestling on a mountaintop called Morano Calabro. Um, and we're looking at, a, I'm going to look at a case study there, which I just started to research on, which um, is a village that, that was losing its population um, and which is um, stigmatized and um, left behind and marginalized in all kinds of ways, but which is now the home of a particular um, project, which I would hesitate to call a heritage project. It's actually much broader than that, as I'm starting to understand, um, which is kind of refilling the village in a, in a new sort of way, which I hope you might be interested in hearing a little bit about. Um, so that we can try and think about the role of heritage and the past in overcoming loss and stigma but also how that might be quite contested uh, locally as well. I just wanted to end then by, connect, by thinking about some connections between these older migrations that I'm really talking about today uh, and new migrations, um, immigrations into Italy from um, Africa, for example, and whether we can make connections there. Okay. So just a little bit of contextual um, history. Some of you will know this and others won't, but it's quite interesting to remember that Italy was only unified as a nation state in, the, in 1861, um, so relatively recently. And um, it was only a couple of decades later that Italy started to experience this mass outflow of population, which till the early 20s progressively led millions to leave the country. And the United States was a main recipient of Italians to the extent that from 18, um, 1880 to 1920, around 4 million uh, moved from Italy to the US, um, with about 2 million of those leaving between 1901 and 1910, particularly in the, from the south of Italy. And these were migrants who were largely rural uh, land workers or, or contadini, peasants, with no formal education, low levels of literacy. And um, you can see also on that map how it wasn't just uh, the United States that was the recipient of um, Italians at this period, but also Australia and in South America in particular, Brazil and Argentina. There was also significant Italian 
uh, emigrations to, to Canada as well. So this um, slide just shows um, that in the year um, 1915, just ignore at the top that it says 49,000 because that's a bit of a mistake. Um, it was a residue from a previous screen capture. Anyway, this, this is the year to focus on is 1915 um, when actually 284,000 uh, Italian migrants left Italy for the US. The causes of these um, emigrations, um, which were, were largely, um, as I say, from the, from the south of Italy, but not exclusively, um, was very much to do with, with a number of um, historical um, push factors and pull factors, uh, a demographic boom in the late 19th century following unification in Italy, increasing pressures on land and food supply, all kinds of relevant issues about the org social organization and the economic organization of the um, southern areas of Italy and the land holdings, um, the organization of land holdings, which I, I won't go into, but we can talk about that if we've got time later. Um, and, and also various other important um, aspects of, of international trade caused by vagaries of, of, of the wine industry, for example, in France, but also the growing influence of the US in providing grain um, and imposition of higher taxes by the Italian government that was starting to sort of get its grip on the um, newly unified country. Okay. So why am I interested in this? So in 2019, I, I was invited to join a fortnight long seminar, which was organized by the, the Center for Italian Diaspora Studies, which is based at the University of Calabria in, Cos, in Cosenza, in, in, um, in the sort of northern part of, of Calabria. And this center undertakes research into the widely dispersed Italian diaspora in uh, North America, South America, uh, and Australasia in particular. Uh, the seminar was organized by um, Professor Margarita Ganeri of the University of Calabria um, with support from um, the Italian Diaspora Studies Institute in Pittsburgh in the USA. And the topic was heritage and memory. And the participants came from three continents, um, most of them diasporic Italians whose families had emigrated from Southern Italy to the so-called New World in the 19th uh, in the 20th century, mainly in the, in the early 20th century. And, and so the program of the seminar is aimed at exploring this broad transnational uh, perspective to the Italian diaspora through what was um, intended as a sort of very uh, community-based project made up of ordinary um, citizens rather than researchers or academics or, or um, officials. And its primary goal was to underline the importance of place and, and through discussion, reading, writing and traveling um, um, together, as Ganeri puts it in the introduction to the book that came out of the seminar, to recover the obscure and often misunderstood roots of experiences, generations and geographies, creating a kind of text of its own. And it also wants to show the diasporic origins of Italy itself, a place where ethnic groups have mixed for millennia and still continue to mix in the present through current immigration. So the seminar programme included all kinds of day visits to a number of villages um, and to the Polino National Park, which is a, a, an area of the Apennines, very mountainous, um, in which um, many of these abandoned villages um, border onto. And many uh, workshop sessions um, with the help of the Italo-American poet Ma Maria Mazziotti Gillan, who is the joint editor of the book. And participants um, were there really to find out about their own connections with Calabria and, um, and to explore their own past family experiences of migration, which had taken them from Italy into the US and Canada and Australia, one or more genera generations previously. And 
I was then not as a member of this Italian diaspora, but as a researcher interested in heritage as it relates to experiences of place um, and belonging and also to the sustainability of place and belonging. So heritage um, for me is, is an active uh, social practice um, that is put into motion when people recognize aspects of the past as being meaningful for them, meaningful for them in the present and also in a projected future, a process of recognition that we actively create in our relationships with people and places over time, rather than any in any um, simple preservation of built environments or, or, or historic assets. So I wanted to join the seminar to explore what kind of meeting place it might provide to bring together participants, divergent times and spaces, and stories of migrations and life journeys, identities, different kinds of connections with the past and with Italy. So as the participants shared um, Calabrian food and explored these old villages and mountains, um, taking part in writing groups and uh, films and lectures, the participants were discovering the similarities, but also the differences of their respective relationships um, to uh, Calabria. Um, and we also uh, were listening to talks about Calabria's um, history, um, such as, as here, you can see this um, um, book cover here by the anthropologist, um, Calabrian anthropologist Vito Tetti, whose vivid anthropological studies um, of the complex relationship um, between those early 20th century peasants and labourers who, who stayed in the fast emptying villages and those who emigrated to what became known as La, La America, all one word, La America. Um, so we learnt during this uh, seminar about this history. Um, and, and also of the mountaintop village where we were staying, which I'll talk about a little bit more shortly, um, where houses had been carefully and sympathetically restored and where a cultural centre was being constructed, which is where the seminar took place. So it felt uh, important to bring this special collection of voices and experiences into further di dialogue with each other once the two weeks were over. Um, and so a collection of the stories and the writing that was generated during the workshop were subsequently published in this volume celebrating Calabria, writing, heritage and memory. And um, as a basis for my contribution to the volu volume, I invited participants to complete a short questionnaire by email, a qualitative uh, open-ended responses um, sometime uh, after the end of the seminar, which asked participants about their motivations for joining and their feelings for their own heritage and their stories about their own pasts. And these, um, so I'll just um, catch up with myself here. Um, so these responses from the participants suggested that at least three different times or temporalities had been converging in Calabria in these two weeks in May 2019. First of all, participants own lives and times as they were living them in their current places of residence. But secondly, their memories of what their parents and grandparents who'd been born in the new world, so-called, had handed down to them. And, and thirdly, the various snatches and glimpses of individual voices and stories from the preceding generations of families who had left the old country in the 1920s and made their way overseas to create these new lives, setting in chain this process of generational stories that resulted in these completely unconnected participants gathering together in Calabria in 2019. Um, bringing these temporalities together reminded me very much of Maurice Halvac's uh, observation that every act of remembering entails not only one's own voice, but also the voices of others, some heard directly uh, heard directly or read, but others coming to us as memories handed down over generations and inflected with new meanings in new times and spaces. So there were different temporalities being brought together. There were also um, different places making their way into this Calabrian encounter. 
um, through these responses that the participants were, were sending me. Different places from which they had come, but places which their ancestors had left, had arrived at, had departed from again and or moved on to. Journeys that often covered entire continents over a century or more. Places that stretched back into individual personal history and the movements of families. Some places mentioned were Chicago, Philadelphia, Florida, Pennsylvania, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, Sydney, forging links with other places mentioned in the old country, Abruzzo, Calabria, Campania, Basilicata, Puglia. Some of these places were just a name for some respondents written on the back of a photo or passed down in memory, but for others, a place of enduring family connections that had been renewed some were able to state decisively the precise names of Italian towns that their ancestors left. One said, for example, my, my father was born in 1902 in Martoni, Reggio Calabria, and my mother was born in Australia to Italian parents. Her mother was from Rapone, Basilica, and her father from Rosetto, Valfortore, Puglia. My father migrated to Sydney in 1924. So these sorts of precise locational details um, and these accord with the observations of historians of the Italian diaspora that it's really the villages, towns and the regions of Italy, um, rather than the, the nation state itself, that are the, often the prime sources of cultural reference for those who left, um, as it is also for those who stayed. And this participant added, my latest DNA results show that I am 97% Italian. There's an indication of that strong sense of, of, of belonging to the old country. So, of course, as uh, Tetti writes uh, in his um, many books on this phenomenon, these attachments to, to village and town in the old country have faded for many current descendants of those early emigrants. Um, in the words of, of Tetti, um, who has studied uh, the relationships between those who left and those who stayed behind. There were always these new second villages, as he calls them, doppio um, paesi, double villages, constructed enthusiastically um, in the mid 20th century, in Toronto, in Philadelphia, in New Jersey, by those who, having left the first village behind, hoped to come together to form a new one. Yet Petty writes about how these second villages have started to splinter and disperse in their own right by the end of the 1980s. Having come to terms with our new reality and begun to find a place within it, the village identity of immigrants, grandchildren and great grandchildren becomes just one small part of a now extended reality, which is just expressed as Calabrian roots or an Italian background and um, a more established American identity or Canadian identity overtakes it. And he writes also about how in the first village, so the, the, the villages left behind in the old country, similarly, a place whose identity was once defined by plentiful and regular messages, he writes, money and photographs emanating from the second village overseas and by the summer return visits, visit, which would fill the streets and the empty houses and piazzas at once again. The remaining connections with the second village have also withered. Um, as Petty says, like the Calabrian figs that used to travel the ocean in the baskets of returnees and whose dwindling journeys symbolize for him the vanishing of this double existence. So this idea of there being two villages, the, the doppio paese, that coexist in the identities and culture of both the leavers and the stayers, um, conscious of not wanting to invoke leavers and remainers into to this talk at all. This is a different sort of leaving and remaining. Um, but this idea of the, of the, of the doppio paesi uh, is really uh, an illusion, says Tetti. It's made of shadows, not only because traditions are always reinvented and reimagined in new times and places, but because, as he says it, the more we try to safe, safeguard the past, the more we leave it behind. And so now we've entered into the post-migration era where the two, both villages are extinguished simultaneously, he says. And this theme of a loss of connection came across quite strongly in respondents' accounts. They wrote of their history being hidden, anonymous, 
unrepresented, misunderstood, often sidelined, and a sadness about not knowing more about their Italian past. And quite a few of them talked about stigma and discrimination that they'd experienced about being of Italian origin. Um, as one um, participant wrote, my heritage is one that I'm striving to create from facts and information previously unknown to me, together with those from my memory. From my father's side, heritage was denied to me by his secrets, and it was also denied by me in a way. Another one writes, growing up after the Second World War in Australia, I did everything to be blend in, to be to blend in, to be Australian. The large influx of Italians drew a good deal of racial discrimination. It was not pleasant being called terrible names for the colour of my skin, my hair and for my surname. I'm sad about the lost opportunity to know more and I'm in the process of filling that gap for me and my children. Another one writes, I'm concerned that the image of Italian Americans is still of a buffoon and or, or crime related. Although there are now many organizations dedicated to changing this perception, and many of us have got educated, social stereotypes, stereotypes are difficult to change and it will take time. So this process of, um, of feeling, these experiences of feeling stigma came across also in one of the um, participants' accounts who contributed a, a, quite a moving piece of writing to the book um, who is himself a, an, an Italian, uh, Valerio, who didn't leave, um, whose family didn't leave for um, the New World, but whose family left Calabria for the north of Italy, which was the other major um, experience of, of internal emigration and migration that um, contributed to the loss of population in Calabria. Um, and this re relates very much to the well-established and enduring historical discourse of the Southern question, um, which, which hits the supposedly modern, prosperous and successful north of the country against a, a negatively perceived, uh, allegedly backward and crime-ridden south, which the discourse that began to build from the time of Italy's unification uh, in the late 19th century, but still very pertinent and very um, influential today in the politics of, of Italy, generating a kind of moral geography in which Italy appears to be dragged down by its southern half, that's how it's depicted. Um, and and in, in, in the book um, of the same name, um, edited by Schneider, um, 2020, this constitutes a kind of internal orientalism in which Calabrian and Sicilian people in particular are depicted as barbaric, as fatalistic, as superstitious, as predisposed to crime, and to an uncontrolled sexuality, a stereotype persisting um, as I suggested today. And um, Valerio writes um, quite um, personally about this. It's as if what I kept distance during my long experience away from Calabria, a place that never offered my father or my family anything in terms of future prospects, is now returning to knock at the door of my soul. And it does so by interrogating me about my identity. Who are you now? Question that's become ever more pressing, especially each time you happen to meet someone who asks where you come from. And when you say you're Calabrian, you notice that a silent frozen gust of wind across their face, which classifies you negatively from an ethnic point of view. Calabrians in today's meaning, he says, aren't considered a good ethnicity. And Calabria itself is a place that excites more fear than curiosity for its beauty, culture, or history. You feel a sense of shame and almost embarrassment in identifying yourself as Calabrian when you live outside it. Even if, as soon as you've admitted it, crime, pride, and dignity in who you really are as a person return. The awareness of being a good person, just like the vast majority of the Calabrian population. So this sense of, of stigma attaching both to the, the second villages that were built by the emigres in the, in the first world, in, in, sorry, in the new world, and to the sort of first villages, the, the old villages in the old country. 
And Rito Chetty's book, Il Senso dei Luoghi, The Sense of Place, Memory and History of Abundant Villages, documents this process of the emptying out of the population, the, 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 um, the deepening uh, of, the, of, the stig, of this process of stigmatization and um, marginalization. Um, so I'm going to just skip this slide because this is really uh, another contribution um, in the book about um, the second villages at this time in, in Patterson and it's a poem by Maria Mazziotti Gillan but I'm not going to spend too much time on that at the moment but it's um, talking about how um, in Patterson the Italians constructed their own Italian villages, these second villages, um, uh, and how the people that they'd left behind, they, they, they never saw again, who became like stick figures gradually fading into lines from the blue airmail letters that they sent and received. And um, where they knew in the new America where the streets were not paved in gold, but where they knew they could give their children better lives than if they stayed in the mountain villages. So it's really the life of the first left behind villages that I just want to focus on just for the rest of this talk, because although there are many um, museums to um, experiences of migration that have started to develop and, and be constructed, they, they've, they, they don't seem, um, at least as far as I can tell in, in reviewing these museums, they don't seem to pay any attention to um, places left behind when, when people leave. So just to, to pay a bit more attention to this phenomenon of abandonment in Calabria, um, that the process that began you know, in the 1920s. Um, and, and really the, the way in which this um, process was um, Started by Italy's embrace of, uh, of the post war economic boom, its period of, of rapid industrial development, the so called economic miracle of the post war years, where it progressed from being one of the weakest economies in Europe to being one of the most powerful with huge increase in GDP. Um, and so much of this industrialization process reaping uh, rewards for the north, with southern Italy, Italy lagging behind. So it was Lombardy, Piedmont, Liguria, the northern areas that, that um, reaped the benefits of this industrial triangle of development, um, with continuing hardship and poverty in the upland and rural areas in the south. And this rapid industrialization in the urban north enacted a second phase of factors encouraging rural workers in the south to abandon the land and head for the cities. So there's a period of intense rural depopulation from the uplands of the Apennines in Calabria into the north continues today even though it's 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 slowing down. Yet in spite of this trend of intensifying um, depopulation in the south, villages in the um, rural south continued to be viable even in the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s and to support significant populations because emigration was accompanied by also a population boom in the whole of Italy but especially in the south and uh, Vito Tetti notes that in the village of his youth the Calabrian villages were still densely populated and could be described as too full. Full, he says, this is the word that speaks to my experiences in the villages of my infancy and youth. The village was full, dense, compact, full of men, women, children and animals. The full of the streets, the countryside, the processions, the festivals, the rallies. The full of stuffed cars, however, later leaving with families crying like those left behind, the full of those who said, see you so soon, but knowing they were lying. And then the full of his own village in Toronto. So he moved with his family to Toronto. 
But this is the soul that created the empty that was left behind and which established these new places elsewhere. The houses closed, but we all thought we'd return, even though many of them never did. So too full has now become empty, vacant, he writes. The interior villages now see the strongholds of the forces of order, schools, post office and hospitals closed down. And the newly populated towns on the coasts too have vacant, often ruined areas. So that when an older person dies, it's not just the end of a story, but of stories in the plural, an epoch, a house, a family. So the lanes and the creases turn into dark corners, empty terrain. And um, skipping on a bit, Calabria is the metaphor for an Italy where no longer places have turned into not yet places unrecognisable to their own inhabitants. However, he turns his attention to this new movement, which is the last bit of the talk that I'm coming on to, um, places potentially being refilled. And he notes that there seems to be a new um, recognition on the part of many younger Italians, um, where there's an awareness how, of how these, these empty villages um, create a sort of stimulus to, to, to fill them back up, a place that calls out and attracts and draws in a new generation. And returning is becoming a theme again, real, dreamt or mythical. And he said, these are narratives that should be unraveled and understood because they reveal the need for something else, for somewhere else. Um, but this time, he says, younger Italians are finding at home, in the past, in abandonment. And he thinks these voices, these memories, can give the places back their own meaning. So this is what is being attempted um, in this particular village where we were staying, um, the village of Morano Calabro, where this uh, cultural center, Il Nibio, which is uh, Italian for a kite, like a red kite, um, is being created with a natural history museum displaying the flora and fauna of the local, very rich um, natural environment. Um, an, an albergo diffuso, which is a sort of idea of um, a, a distributed hotel where the rooms are not contained in one building, but each small old house has been restored to provide uh, a room. Um, and then the albergo, the, the hotel has, a, has a, a, a central square and a, a, a bar. And so this um, is a, an attempt at, at renewal, showing here the very mountainous terrain that, that we're talking about. Um, and, and in this particular um, case, we can see, um, I'm just going to see if I can just show you quickly. You can't hear this um, video, but what, what, what's being shown there is a collection of some of the old costumes that um, um, the one of the movers and shakers, Nicola, is the person you can see there, um, have been um, collecting old costumes, um, old tools, all kinds of things from these abandoned houses that in many cases were simply locked up and closed and which have now been, which, which you can now buy for, for, for very small amounts of money and which um, Nicola and his friends are, are, are trying to um, restore with this, with this project. Um, and La Pacchiana is quite an interesting word because it refers to that costume that he's holding up there, but also it's a very stigmatized word and it goes back to this question of this sort of Calabrian stigma um, because Pacchiana has now come to mean something, you, you'd use it to describe something that's, that's vulgar or, or trashy in some way um, devalued. Whereas in fact, it, it was a word that, that simply meant those who worked outside on the land. So um, I interviewed Nicola again just, just last week in an attempt to try and um, keep up to date with this project, try and find out how it's um, continuing on. Um, 
and and how it's also trying to refill Morano um, from its pre previous gradual abandonment with this new cultural project. And Nicola told me that nothing, none of this has happened by a, a reliance on money because it, it hasn't been possible for them to get funding for any of these renewal projects. According to him, the, the local politicians are not interested. They don't want to give support to any attempts at reconstruction or renewal. He says they don't value what's been there for generations and, and what's still there. They don't value the old houses, materials that can be salvaged and renewed. They don't value the, the trees, the plants, the natural environment. They don't want, he says, any change to the current status quo in which they keep power through this clientelism that has blighted the area for decades. They don't want, he says, to have people take things into their own hands, but that's what you've got to do. And he calls it auto costruzione, as a process of self-construction or self-building. So that's what he and his brothers and their families have been doing gradually over the past 15 years, rebuilding the houses that lay empty. They were either given to them by the owners or which they were able to buy for virtually nothing, including in many cases their contents, their furniture, allowing them to create this place that we were staying in. Um, and to set up a small museum of natural history which displays the fauna and the flora of the local area to try and uh, raise awareness of the rich diversity of the, um, of the environment. And he says that what's important in this project is that you value what's already in your hands, that you recognise its beauty, its historical importance. And then you need the courage to project a vision and to produce plans and to turn them into reality. He's very clear that this is not a museum. Instead, it's a meeting place, he says, that's growing in many different directions, which we hope will never end. A community is inclusive. It grows as people bring in their own new directions and propose new projects. So it's, it's a model of development that's bottom up based on something that everybody can achieve. And at the moment, they're trying to raise money to restore the local church and to create a music club there to teach music to every child free of charge. So just to sort of wrap up, as I mentioned earlier, there were these, there are these museums of migration, which have been, are being established in many different countries. Um, in the USA, in, in, in Britain, um, documenting migrant stories, but they don't seem to tell the stories of the originating communities. And I'm interested in how the people left behind feel and how they may start to build new projects that can rebuild using a sense of the past, a, a new sense of, of the future, and how we could connect these experiences of migration of leaving and staying behind together, but also of return, of coming back. So my last slide, just some suggestions for future directions for research. Um, what I'm going to do immediately is to try and um, follow up with some of the um, other inhabitants involved in the project in Murano try and find out about other similar projects happening in these abandoned villages in Calabria. But also perhaps try and make connections with other stigmatized places and how they've been using their own heritage and how, again, this is quite a contested and difficult process, which would connect back to some of the work that I, I did uh, years ago in the valleys, in the Welsh valleys and the mining past. But also how to link in with new uh, refugee stories and migrant stories with arrivals from Africa more recently into Calabria via this process of the, of the so-called Black Mediterranean echoing Paul Gilroy's analysis of the Black Atlantic. And in particular, the story that hit the headlines a couple of years ago of Riace in Calabria, this um, abandoned village that's been um, purposely a, a place of welcoming for um, migrants arriving on the shores of Italy from Somalia, from, from Libya um, and from other places which um, has 
given a home to um, migrants, but which is very much um, in question, whose, whose future is very much in question because the local mayor who was the dynamic force behind it has been um, imprisoned and accused of um, encouraging illegal immigration into Italy. So it's a story that's ongoing and, and with a very uncertain outcome at the moment. But I'm going to leave it there just with those ideas of how I think this is a, a, um, a, a line of research that I think has got lots of um, potential to develop in the future. Should I have any time to do so? Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot, Bella. Um, it was re really interesting. <laughs> um, so I guess if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to add those into the chat um, or alternatively, if you want to put up your hand and ask a question that way. Um, yeah, feel feel free. Um, I can I can just let people go. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I have a question. This is nowhere near close to anything I have any understanding of, but yeah, I was interested in the, in the parallels between the current migration into Italy, um, you know, and the sort of that story, I guess, I guess the question, the question, it's a very poorly formed one, but, um, uh, you know, do you, do you see sort of similar challenges in Somalia and Libya and these places that are sort of potentially being abandoned, um, you know, for for a migration towards Italy and this is sort of a similar, is, is there a similarity there or is it, is it quite different? Well, I think that that's the kind of question that would be really interesting to explore because it, it the emphasis is on the arrivals, isn't it? It's, it's on the people who are arriving on the shores of Italy or other places. And the stories that, that, that they're bringing are being represented um, slowly. Um, but, but what about those people who are the, the originating communities from where they came? I don't know anything about this at the moment. I don't know anything about these um, places in, in Libya and Somalia, which have given rise to these two ways of immigration. Um, there's, there's also, of course, places like Syria, who've, you know, which have been um, losing huge numbers of, of, of people. So I think these are, these are the sorts of stories that we can use as, as these sorts of questions, rather, that we can use as a basis for um, asking different sorts of questions, not just about the places that people arrive, the places from where they came, and and the people who are still there. Yeah, yeah that's that's great. Yeah, I know it's fascinating. We have a question from from Neil. Um, thanks, Bella. Do you know how abandonment and reclamation of property title has impacted these villages, and what this means for protection of heritage? Mm. Property title. Well. It's, 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 I think my, my impression so far is that there have been um, many decades of um, legal wrangles in some cases about who owns these properties. Um, I haven't got any sort of hard and fact figures to go on, but this is, this is simply just what I've picked up. Um, and that in fact, in some of the second villages in, in the USA, um, some of the participants in the seminar talked about how there were wrangles um, in their parents' lifetimes over who had the title to the properties back home in the old country in the first village. So the, 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 there's definitely narratives of that about that, and I think those have been written about. I think there's a literature about that, um, which I'm not particularly familiar with. But in relation to some of these villages, um, particularly um, Murano seems to be the case that Many of these um, houses were simply locked up when people left because the people who left were fully intending to return. They weren't intending to go forever. Um, and they often left behind the older, the very older generation. Often it seems with, with, with one of the, um, the, one of the sort of children, often the daughter 
who was supposed to stay behind and look after the aging parents until the others would come back. But that generation died out and those houses simply were closed up. And some, very often, I, I, I gather, the, there was no more interest in the, in the old houses from the people who'd left. So Nicola was able to, to find houses that, that were simply exactly as they'd been left in the, in the 1930s and the 1940s or 20s um, with all of the, the, their furniture still inside them and nobody had come back to reclaim it. So there must be a whole process there um, of establishing these property rights, um, which it would be interesting to find out more about. Great, thanks. Are there any other questions um, for Bella uh, at this stage? It's looking quiet on the on the chat. Um, oh, one 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 more question here. So, and I'm just going to allow you to talk. There we go. I think you're you're unmuted now. Thank you. Uh, has there been any um, comparison research? to do with rural villages in places like China, where there's been massive population um, um, shift to the cities? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, Anne. Um, but thank you for, for um, mentioning that, because that's a really relevant context as well. Um, and, and certainly that there's, there's quite a lot of um, Chinese scholars, Chinese scholars working in the fields of heritage at the moment. So that would certainly be, be something to explore as well. I think it's, mm. a, it's a much broader yeah. phenomenon, isn't it, than than just um, the one that I've been discussing. Yeah, yeah. And um, having done the North Coast 500 uh, two years ago, and to see the um, change in population from the 18th and 19th century. Uh, on the east coast, top northeast coast of Scotland, um, sometimes there's also not just an economic push, but there's also a, a direct push from landowners as well. Has any influence been or any study of the influences there on, on this phenomenon? Mm. Again, I'm sure there are. Um, I'm sure there are. And, and, um, it would be really interesting to, you know, to look at that. Um, I, I'm, I'm very much at the beginning of this research at the moment, so I haven't, you know, got, got, a, got a sort of overall picture of this at the moment. But I think um, there are going to be all sorts of similarities, but also differences in the different experiences. Um, it's definitely something that we can, we can explore in the future. Thank you. Great, thanks. I've got one more from, from Marga. Um, I think you're unmuted now, Marga. Hi, thank you very much Hi. for the, hello, Bella. Thank you very hello. much for the, for the talk. I find it fascinating, but also as well is one in which I felt very reflected in it without expecting in time when I came to the talk. I am a grandchild of, um, of an immigrant um, of a granddad from father's from mother's side who was born in Argentina and went back to Mallorca to where the family came from and from my dad size my grandmother as well she went to Argentina when she was little and she returned to the island when she was 18 therefore from my two parents side I had I have dads that both of them um, members that they went to Argentina, they got uh, land there, and then after they sold it, went back to Mallorca, bought land in Mallorca, and redone, and, and just come back, and come back to the island as nothing happened. And it's something that's very interesting, because um, I don't think it's something they are ashamed of, but it's something that is not that talk that much about, and I know very little about their life when they were abroad and that is very interesting and I think in Spain it's quite similar uh, to Italy and as well the divide between the economy on the north and the south ambitions between the north and the south is very similar 
However, for example, in Mallorca, we don't have that of empty villages because the territory is very limited, therefore every square meter counts. But I think that is a, a similar pro problem that is happening in the north of uh, Spain, when there are a lot of villages that they don't have enough population for the villages to, to go on and, and, and to move on uh, in life. And I think, I don't know, it may be in there, there is some parallelism with, with Italy, but I think as well is very interesting on the way you are approaching uh, the sense of place uh, is very sophisticated because you have people that the sense of place is not attached to one place, but is in between two different places or is the amalgamation yeah. and the, the intersection between that two different places. And I find that fascinating because it takes away from the, the way I understand a uh, place as an architect that usually I go back to the more physical aspects or how the reflection of the economics and the socials on that when I think in your case is very much about the symbolic uh, making the meaning making and the culture in a more intangible way before I find it um, I don't have a specific question but just um, some comments that may help or add to the discussion. Thank you, Margaret. Yes, that's really, really um, helpful. And also to remind us about this sense in which um, so many of these connections that people have, you know, just sort of one or two generations ago are often not talked about and often just seem to be, to be silenced. But now it seems to be a moment in which there's more attention being paid to these um, quite recent stories of, 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 of migration, of displacement, of, of return, as, you, as, as you've described. And I, so I think, yes, these experiences of this sort of in-betweenness, this sense of, of um, not here and there, but of both together, but not as an amalgamation either, something different. Um, I think these, these are very much feelings sort of of this moment that we're in. Great. And well, thanks again, Bella, and thank you, everybody, for um, for joining us. I, I appreciate that we're we're at an hour now, and um, I'm sure if, if you have any further questions, um, um, please get in touch with Bella via email. Um, yeah. So so thanks again. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we have one more place seminar um, that will be uh, two weeks uh, from now before we have our summer break. Um, and that's on placemaking in, in True Herbert. So hopefully I will see you guys here again um, when, in two weeks. Um, and um, thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Enjoy the sun, hopefully, uh, where you are. So cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Well, thanks.